In terms of depth of information, once again, um, it can be incredibly um, cursory, meaning to say it only includes a little bit of information, or it could be extremely detailed, where it includes a lot of um, documentation and, and in, um, information about each of the different forms of practice. The idea is that, though, when you do an inventory, you should ensure that a certain uniformity of detail is included for all the objects that are there. Otherwise, it becomes quite difficult to use. Consistency and classification. And so, um, for the purposes of the inventory being, a being kind of easy to understand and practical to use, um, there should be some level of internal consistency. You might also uh, strive to achieve a certain level of consistency with other inventories. Meaning to say, you can look at inventories that are done by other people and see whether your own inventory is comparable to theirs in some way or another. Or it could be incredibly unique and specific so that the way that these inventories are developed um, very much follow the community's own system of doing inventories. Um, and so this is a choice that remains to be made. And so depth of information, um, you know, it depends how much we want to go and whether we want to include other domains, etc. as well. Conformity and rights and respect. So once again, um, kind of a check for the people who are putting together the inventories um, to make sure that all the elements that are included on the inventory are in conformity with international human rights instruments or the principles of mutual respect that are specified in the convention. And so, so that's at the, at the national level. So countries and governments um, and various other agencies who operate um, within a country, including at the local level as well, have a responsibility to do all of those different things. Now, coming back to the fact that it is international in scope, what are the um, processes that are in place to ensure international cooperation or um, frameworks for safeguarding intangible cultural heritage? Um, what the convention um, sets out is a mechanism for developing a number of different lists. There are two lists in particular. One is what is called the representative list of intangible cultural heritage for humanity. The second is a list of intangible cultural heritage in need of urgent safeguarding. Um, and there are also support mechanisms um, in terms of international cooperation as well as funding as well. And so, Let's look first at the list of intangible cultural heritage in need of urgent safeguarding. And this is the list that UNESCO is trying to promote. But these publications um, are um, um, basically registers or lists, these two different lists. So one is the, um, as you can see, the quite thick one is the representative list. And the thinner one is the list of intangible cultural heritage in need of urgent safeguarding. And then finally, there's a third publication, which is the Register of Best Safeguarding Practices. Okay, so the, the first list, which is the Urgent Safeguarding List. This is basically a list which UNESCO is trying to encourage countries to um, identify um, elements of intangible cultural heritage which are in danger, um, which need a safeguarding plan, which need international assistance. And these, once things are put on this list, um, countries are eligible to ask for money from the, um, the fund for intangible cultural heritage in order to put in place um, programs and activities to try to um, revitalize these things that are in danger. Why are they in danger? They might be in danger even though the community or the government is doing its very best to try to revive it, but for some reason it's just not successful. Or it could be in danger because it's being neglected and um, it's very, really on the, on the brink of disappearing. And so once that last elderly practitioner who knows how to do that one thing dies, then basically um, it's very difficult to bring it back. And so in order to be included on this list, if you read the operational directives, it will include a number of different criteria that have to be satisfied in terms of the community being involved, a safeguarding plan being in place, etc. And go to the second list, which is the representative list. And so this list is a list which is aimed at trying to recognize elements. And in so doing, um, once they're on the list, the hope is that um, visibility about that 
form of intangible cultural heritage will increase. More people will know about it. More people will be aware of it. They'll be aware of its significance. Um, and they'll also contribute to cultural dialogue as well, so that different cultural, tr different cultural traditions of different communities are recognized and, uh, by other communities, so they realize that these things are there in place. And so, as you can see now, countries um, have been very enthusiastic about putting things on this list, the representative list, because they're sort of still in the beauty pageant mentality. They want more and more things to be on this list because it makes them feel special. But really, that's not the point. The point is to try to spend much more time on the other list, which is this list, which is the urgent safeguarding list, which is to say that the international community, through the framework of this convention, is poised to give attention to these things which are quickly about to disappear. So on the cover here, you can see is um, a traditional ritual that takes place um, in Africa where it's a communal fishing activity. So all the people who live in this particular area of the San uh, come together, no matter what ethnic group or what tribe they are, and they collectively go into this lake and they fish. Um, but as you can see from the picture, there's not much water left. The lake is drying up. And so one of, among various sociological and economic reasons why it's no longer so much popular is the very fact that the lake is no longer a lake, but it's like a muddy hole. And so um, it means it's in danger. And so, you know, what are ways that we can help to try to ensure that this practice, which for generations has been instrumental in ensuring that all these different tribes would live together in some form of harmony, can somehow be um, um, maintained. And so that's the representative list.